Hello, today is September 23rd, and we're here with State Representative Tom Demmer, a Republican running for re-election in the 90th District. I'm Tammy Sloop, Regional Editor with Shaw Media, and I'm joined by Derek Barrichello, News Editor for The Times and News Tribune in LaSalle County, as well as Tim Eggert, a reporter with Sauk Valley Media. Thanks for meeting with us today, Tom. Happy to be here. Um, first off, can you talk about why you're running for re-election? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm running for re-election. I've been serving in the House um, over the past several years because I, I believe in Illinois. I love Illinois. I was born and raised here, and this is my home. Um, my wife and I uh, live here with our three-year-old daughter. And, you know, I, I've just always had a, a great attachment to the, to the communities around us. And I've also seen what the kind of the um, reputation of Illinois is across the country and, you know, in many parts of the state as well. Um, people are leaving Illinois because there are better opportunities for themselves or their families in other places. And I've also seen, though, the, the very positive things that we have going on in our state and some of the new developments or the new jobs or investments that have come in. And I think that Illinois has the more compelling and stronger case to make about why this is such a good place to live, to work, to raise a family. And so I've really tried to dedicate my time in Springfield to um, working in a bipartisan way on things that I think will improve the quality of life and the opportunities for people in Illinois. Uh, I think there's a good opportunity for younger folks to get involved in, in government and try to lead by example and show that there's uh, more positive and more good things going for us than what maybe some of the other narratives might be showing. And how would you rate the state of Illinois' response to COVID-19? And, and what, if anything, should have been done differently? Well, you know, I think the response to COVID-19 was first, you know, something that caught everybody off guard. I mean, this was, this is a totally unprecedented circumstance. Um, I have seen some incredible work done, especially, you know, among local officials who had this kind of dropped in their lap and had to make judgment call after judgment call and decision after decision about what was the appropriate way to um, you know, to, to make some health restrictions to ensure that the spread of COVID was slowed, um, to try to support and um, be there to provide the resources that individuals and, and local businesses needed, um, as well as try to, you know, make some longer term plans and changes that could help us make it through this as long as it lasts. You know, we still don't know exactly how long it lasts. So I give great recognition to, you know, the local health departments, um, local the city staffs, um, you know, village, county officials, uh, school officials, certainly in this back to school time, you know, they did a tremendous amount of work, teachers who are back in the classrooms. I, I rate their, their desire to do the right thing, their hard work in determining what that is, um, and their every day dealing with the unexpected curveballs. I, I, you know, I give them a very high rating. From a state perspective, I think there were a number of positive things that were done, but I would say that in an area for improvement, and this is something that you know I, I've personally talked with Governor Pritzker about is, uh, and I, I called for, I put forward my own plan and recommendations earlier in the spring about the importance of getting local buy-in to decisions that were made at a state level. Um, I think if we look at people understanding why decisions were made, what motivated those decisions, uh, but also having the confidence that the statewide decisions um, that they were that that uh, local circumstances were being taken into account, I think would have greatly improved people's confidence in those decisions and their compliance with those decisions. Um, I heard quite a bit from you know some of those local officials who were you know doing their best to do a good job that sometimes you know a decision would be made and applied statewide, and they had a lot of questions about local unique circumstances and how to deal with those and they maybe didn't get the uh the support that they needed and so i really encourage the governor uh, both directly in conversation and also you know through trying to come forward with public proposals of my own um, to take into account regional variations to take into account some of the local concerns that people had and to try to enlist those folks to be supportive of and to be collaborated with uh, as decisions were made. 
So I, I think that part of it could have been handled better, that coordination up and down the, the chain of government there probably would have alleviated some of the really difficult spots that people found themselves in. Um, aside from his COVID response, how would you rate Governor Pritzker's overall performance? You know, COVID is such a big part of that right now, you know, but uh, I, I understand, you know, we have to think about some of the other areas that things have been handled. Um, you know, I, I would say that uh, last year and in, in 2019, there were a number of items that um, the governor and um, House and Senate Republicans and Democrats worked collaboratively on. And I thought there were some positive things we could take away from that. Uh, unfortunately, this year, so much of the decision making has happened in the executive branch. Um, so many things have been, you know, for the sake of expediency or, or whatever the case is, have been given away from the General Assembly, away from the legislature, and into the executive branch. And I think we're missing some of the effective checks and balances that we need in order to have an effective government. And so, you know, I, I've been encouraging uh, Governor Pritzker and members of his administration to engage with representatives and senators who come from communities all across Illinois. You know, everybody in Illinois can be confident that with their elected representative and their senator, that their voice is being, is being heard um, in decisions of the legislature. And I think that's a really important concept that the governor should, be, should embrace more fully, that sometimes in emergency situations, you know, there has to be quick action taken by an executive. But as time goes on, as we find ourselves months and months and months away from the first action, if we're going to be setting public policy for a longer period of time, the legislature has to be involved in order to give people in Illinois the confidence and the, the trust that they should have um, in, their, in their government. So I would say that, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think Governor Pritzker has showed that in some areas he has worked well with the legislature, in some areas he hasn't, and I would encourage him to, to try to draw from some of those positive examples and use those relationships and those templates um, to address some of the big questions that, and challenges that we face today. And, and you're a member of the, the Special House Committee in investigating uh, Michael Madigan and, and ComEd. Um, what is your role on that committee? And, um, you know, where is the committee at with the process? So this is a special investigative committee that was convened under the House rules um, in the, the part of the House rules that allows for the House to discipline one of its own members. And so this is separate and distinct from federal criminal investigations that are ongoing. This is not about um, bringing criminal charges. Instead, this is about the House being able to uh, examine the conduct of our own members. It was convened, it's, it only has been invoked uh, once or twice in the history of the state of Illinois. So it's a very serious and solemn process. Uh, when the committee is established, there are three Republicans and three Democrats who are appointed. Um, I was one of the three Republicans appointed, and I'm, I serve as the lead Republican, the minority spokesperson on that committee. And so between myself and uh, Chris Welch, representative um, from the Chicago suburbs, uh, who's a, the Democratic chairman of the committee, the two of us are collaborating to set up when meetings happen, um, who will call as witnesses, uh, what documents and information we seek, and at the end of the day, our committee is charged with reviewing all that information and determining whether a charge exists. And in this case, the charge is whether Speaker Madigan engaged in conduct unbecoming a legislator um, that constituted a breach of the public trust. And so we're really focused, you know, again, not on, the, uh, not on a criminal charge like you might see in the federal prosecutor's office, but instead on those, con those questions of conduct of a legislator. Um, we will return to our second meeting of that committee next week, and we've invited uh, an initial list of witnesses to appear to testify. And so we're, right now we're awaiting their reply um, as we continue to try to walk through this in a very, um, a very serious and diligent way to try to gather facts that resulted from uh, really a, a bombshell deferred prosecution agreement that ComEd entered into uh, with the United States Attorney's Office over the course of the summer. Okay. Um, switching gears a little bit here, uh, upon Exelon's announcement 
that they'd be closing nuclear plants in the state, um, including the Byron plant. Uh, you said you would not take that decision as final and lawmakers would continue discussions with policymakers. What movement has been made on this issue? And have you personally had any conversations with Exelon officials or the governor's office? Yes, I've had conversations with both Exelon officials and the governor's office. Um, the governor has a energy policy working group that's being led by Deputy Governor Christian Mitchell. Um, the, day the, uh, the day the announcement came through, I, I called Christian and we had a conversation um, about how their committee was going to uh, investigate this and talk about some of the policy options that were on the table. Um, I also requested and uh, he agreed that they would um, save time in that committee for local Byron officials to come in and share their story and talk about the local impact of the plant. And so that's, uh, that's something that we're going to be um, doing at one of their upcoming meetings. Um, I also had conversations with Exelon and, and uh, you know, honestly, uh, with Exelon, I, I requested uh, financial, detailed financial information from Exelon about the plant specifically, um, asked them for what some of the things that, you know, what, are, what were the pressures that they took into account when they made the closure decision, uh, as well as they laid out the timeline of different steps that will happen over the course of the upcoming months um, that, uh, that they're, they'll, they'll be required to do if they were to go through with the closure. And so some of the decision points that we might have as a legislature the other thing that I, I did was, you know, I met with um, some of the local local officials. So you think about the city, the county, the school district, forest preserve, uh, park district, library, all those kind of folks. They have a consortium, uh, and we we had a meeting, uh, an initial meeting, talking about some of the kind of laying the the basis or the the background for how we got to this point of of uh, decision. Uh, as well as, um, you know, I invited them to start putting together some of the local impact numbers about how many jobs and how much in taxes and some of the local economic indicators. The other thing, and this is, you know, one that uh, I think shows that this is not just a regional issue. Um, you know, I've, I've worked hard over the past several years to develop relationships with both Republicans and Democrats. And so, you know, you get an you get understanding and a feel for um, what, who might be most concerned by an announcement like this? Clearly somebody like me where it's, you know, a plant is in our district, but you also start to think of some other folks who might be allies in, in uh, working to reverse the closure, closure decision. And so I reached out to colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Um, we have a, a group of Republicans and Democrats who um, are meeting just, to, you know, kind of among ourselves uh, who have come from, you know, Chicago to Southern Illinois um, and each bring a little bit different perspective to what we're looking for. Some people from the jobs and employment side, some people from the um, energy sustainability side, um, you know, and, and some people from the, the desire to have zero carbon uh, energy generation uh, as we go forward. So we, we tried to get a, a small coalition of us together uh, to say, you know, what could we do to, to put put forward some solutions and some suggestions that right off the bat would have bipartisan support. You know, how could we use that as sort of a catalyst um, to help move those discussions along? And so, you know, we've had a couple of productive meetings um, among, uh, among our kind of subset of legislators about uh, trying to put some kind of ideas on paper and um, see where everybody could agree and where we might be able to move forward together. I assume you're, you're, the reaction you're getting out there from the public and stakeholders is there's a real fear about the impact of this. What are you saying to, what do you tell them when they come to you and say, we're going to lose all these jobs, we're going to lose all this, this tax revenue, um, it's just going to obliterate, you know, our community. Yeah, I mean, first, I, I, I absolutely agree with them. I think the impact is really significant and severe. Uh, the second thing I say is, you know, it's not going to happen without a fight. The ComEd uh, or the Exelon release that made the announcement said they're going to continue to work with stakeholders. Um, you know, we've been working in, in Springfield with um, Exelon officials on a number of items over the course of several years. Um, you know, we've tried to understand the condition of the various nuclear plants in Illinois, understand how that fits into the overall energy portfolio picture, and try to make a strong case for 
the reliability of nuclear energy, the fact that it's a zero carbon uh, energy generation source, and then also the significant economic impact that it has, you know, not just in the, in the city of Byron where it's, you know, most uh, obviously seen, but the amount of money, the number of people who come to work at the plant during outages, the number of, you know, local vendors and support that, you know, the, the purchases that Exelon makes uh, in the area has a significant ripple effect. And so, you know, we're trying to uh, enlist more people, you know, it's not just the people who can see the plant out their window, right, but, but to get a larger regional coalition behind that. And uh, I think we're, we're going to do our best to make a strong case to say, let's keep that plant open and let's not take this one decision as final. Mm -hmm. did, did you feel blindsided by the announcement? Uh, I was really surprised at the timing of the announcement. Um, you know, over the past year, uh, year and a half, there have been some uh, warnings that Exelon gave about the, the Byron plant, about the Dresden plant. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it, it didn't completely catch people off guard, but I was very surprised at the timing of the announcement and then how quickly the, the planned closure was to happen. I, I figured there would be a longer lead time there. So it's a, it certainly added a great, great sense of urgency to us. Um, but for an issue that, you know, we've been having some conversations about and trying to learn the background on um, over the last year or two. Okay. It, and it seems like you're, you're having the right conversations with the right people. Do you personally feel optimistic that a closure can be prevented? I think a closure can be prevented. Um, the real challenge here is going to be uh, first a question of timing. Mm -hmm. You know, there is, a, there is a clock that's ticking on this decision. Um, we need to get the legislature to come together and act quickly and decisively in a time frame that works uh, for the, the decision makers at Exelon. Um, but I, I do think that we have, you know, this, this is not an issue where me as the representative for the district is the only voice out there saying that these plants need to be saved. There is already a coalition who's trying to work together on this. And I think that, you know, nothing is, nothing is certain, um, you know, when it comes to passing legislation, absolutely. But I think that there are some really positive indicators right now that people are genuine and sincere about finding a, a solution to this issue. Um, I think Derek has a question for you. Uh, shift in topics. Um, what are your thoughts on the, the fair tax amendment? So, uh, you know, when the, the question of the fair tax, uh, the graduated income tax came before us in the house, um, I voted no on that proposal. Uh, my real concern is that, you know, over the, past, over the, the last decade, uh, we've seen a couple times where the state's income tax was increased. And, you know, one time it was put in place and said, this is a temporary tax. We'll use the revenues to take care of our old bills and pension obligations, and then we'll be back on solid footing. That clearly hasn't been the case. I've also seen as a, a member of, I'm the, the Republican spokesperson on the Appropriations for Human Services Committee, um, every year, every year I've served in Springfield, we have new proposals costing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars above and beyond what our current spending levels are. Uh, I don't believe that in Springfield we've shown enough uh, fiscal discipline to control spending and to make good on our existing obligations uh, to, go, to, go, to go back to taxpayers and again ask for more money in taxes. I think that the temptation would be too great with a graduated scheme to make changes to uh, rate structure, make changes to a bracket, the level of a, a tax bracket year after year. And I think that most people would assume that, uh, you know, if this passes, the schedule that's in place right now is not going to be the same schedule that's in place five or 10 years from now. Um, so people should, uh, should understand that there will be a really significant temptation in Springfield each year to just make some tweaks and get a little extra tax revenue every single year to pay for some of those priorities. I instead think, you know, I, I think we need to show that we're being good fiscal stewards. Uh, both this year and last year, uh, Governor Pritzker has asked his agency directors to identify, uh, last year it was a, a, as much as six and a half percent in spending reductions that they could implement in their agencies. None of those suggestions were ever shared with the legislature, and none of those were built into the budget. 
This year, he's again asked for, I think, a 5% and a 10% uh, reduction scenario. You know, he just asked for that this month, but I, I hope we start to see those. I believe that if we want to demonstrate good faith to taxpayers, we should be asking those questions each year. And even if we don't take every possible suggestion, we should adopt some of them each year to show that we're making some kind of progress in the expense reduction category. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the state of the economy is specifically in your district and how have you worked to grow jobs? Yeah, so this, the state of the economy in our district, obviously, you know, across the country has taken a taken a significant uh, hit because of COVID. But, you know, I, I, I think that part of the um, part of the strength of an area comes in some of the future planning that you can do to try to bring in new opportunities when the economy is good. So that way, when there is a downturn, there are still some positive things going on. A couple of items that I, I'd point to is, um, you know, a, a year and a half ago, um, I led negotiations with Deputy Governor Dan Hines. We sat down and came up with a bipartisan agreed um, uh, package of pro-jobs reforms that helped jumpstart some new investments um, in Illinois during a period in which the economy was doing very well. Um, those investments, along with uh, some of the capital grants that I've worked to secure for the area, um, have led to, in DeKalb, for example, the location of the Ferrara Candy Company and up to a thousand new jobs that are that are being uh, created there, as well as right across the street from that project, um, a project that came as a result of a, a bill that um, I was the, the lead negotiator on, that was the Data Center Incentive Act, um, which I had heard year after year after year was something that Illinois was missing out on opportunities from because we had no such act in place and other states did. And so Illinois was losing these huge projects. And so, you know, I sat down and talked to folks um, from our area who knew that we had the fiber optic network, we had the water infrastructure, the power infrastructure, and the land that was perfect for data centers. Really an attractive place across Northern Illinois for the location of data centers. And so, uh, you know, we, we saw less than a year after that, that act was put in place, Facebook announced a $800 million investment in DeKalb uh, for the creation of a data center there. Those are the kind of things that, you know, when we sat down and said, what can we do to take advantage of these opportunities now? I think it was a good thing that we, that we were able to accomplish that because now, even though there's the downturn happening in COVID, there are thousands of construction jobs that are being filled in those areas now. There will be over a thousand permanent jobs that come out of those projects. And so I've really tried to engage local leaders to say, what are some of the strengths that our area has and what can we do to provide just a little extra spark or a little extra push over the finish line to help make sure that Illinois wins in some of those competitions with other states. We've touched on uh, several topics so far. Um, what, what are some of your top priorities and, and um, how do you propose accomplishing these? So two priorities that I'll talk about. Uh, the first is ethics reform. Um, you know, over the past couple of years in Springfield, we've seen a shocking number of legislators, um, of local officials be indicted on federal criminal charges for behavior that's been going on for far too long. Um, I'm personally a sponsor of a bill that would prohibit legislators from serving as lobbyists while they're elected to office. I think that seems like sort of a low hanging fruit and, and something that came up as a result of um, one of the corruption probes that's ongoing right now. But several of my colleagues uh, and I have, pre have presented these bills together as an ethics reform package that we really think, you know, that this is not just a Republican or Democratic issue either. The governor's um, signaled support for these in his state of the state messages. Um, other Democrats have signaled support for these in public statements. We really have to get ethics reform accomplished if we want the, the people of Illinois to be able to start rebuilding some of the trust um, that they should have in, in government. Uh, the second item, and I spend a really significant amount of time on uh, healthcare policy. Uh, I'm, I serve as our caucus lead in, in healthcare policy. And this is one of those areas where, you know, I try to, to share the lessons that we've learned in this, in uh, working on a program like the state's Medicaid program. For the past several years, we've convened a 
bipartisan, bicameral Medicaid working group that meets throughout the entire year, not just while we're in Springfield. Um, and even now we continue to meet um, over Zoom. And we each year have tackled really significant issues in the state's Medicaid program to try to improve healthcare access in areas of the state that struggle with finding providers and healthcare services, and also for populations because of their income or other socioeconomic factors have a difficult time finding uh, access to healthcare. And each year we come up with a comprehensive Medicaid omnibus bill that is supported by um, all members of our committee. And then we go out and uh, recruit support for the bills from the rest of the, the members of the General Assembly. This year, in a year where not a lot of things passed unanimously, this year the Medicaid omnibus bill passed unanimously. And I think it's a testament to the fact that when you have important issues like that, like in improving access to healthcare, there's a good way to get all people involved on that and to get to get support from, from both sides of the aisle and from people of all parts of the state. So I think that, uh, you know, that's been an area where we've really spent a, a significant amount of time during my, my time in the legislature, but one that's particularly rewarding because of some really positive steps that we've been able to take to improve healthcare access and affordability across Illinois. Can you, the bill that was uh, approved unanimously, can you point to one or two things in that bill and how that specifically will help people with access and affordability? Yeah, you know, one of the items that uh, has gotten attention over the last several years is around um, uh, adolescent and juvenile uh, behavioral health care. Um, we have really worked to allocate funding for um, juvenile and behavioral health care facilities in Illinois because so many of these kids were being um, you know, provided care in a setting that just wasn't right for them. They might have been stuck in an emergency room for a long period of time. Uh, they, might have, uh, they might have been in a facility that's designed for short-term stabilization, but then they didn't have anywhere to go beyond that. We, we talk about that as that's a, a beyond medical necessity um, scenario where they just really weren't getting the kind of care and support that they needed. And so we've put in place funding uh, measures. Uh, we've convened a task force to come up with recommendations about how we can build um, capacity in those networks and allocate additional funding um, to build those networks, which will help, you know, most importantly, get those kids the care that they need. But then secondarily, it'll help relieve some of the crowding and congestion that today blocks people who need it from being able to get in um, to see those providers. Uh, we've also just done a number of um, a number of changes to, to help streamline the uh, process and the relationship that people have with Medicaid managed care organizations um, who the state contracts with to provide uh, coordination of care. And so it, it will be less, you know, uh, it'll be something that's less the responsibility of the patient to say, okay, I need to go see a social worker and I need to arrange transportation to get to my primary care office and then get to the pharmacy. You know, there are so many aspects of providing comprehensive care. Um, and we've passed measures to require those managed care organizations to have access in geographic areas, to build networks in those areas, and then also streamline some things to help people get all the services that they need and not just you know, maybe the one or two that are convenient for them to get to. So I, I think, you know, those, those aspects of coordinating the care and then finding where gaps exist and putting funding towards that, both of those have been um, ongoing and I think really important initiatives for us to improve Illinois' healthcare system. Okay, thanks. How would you, or how have you advocated for the district's um, agricultural economy? So, you know, I work quite a bit with the, the Farm Bureau um, and had a really good relationship with them um, over the past several years. Um, you know, there are some, some simple things like um, during COVID, you know, it worked to, to, with both state and federal officials to make sure that agricultural families were eligible to receive some of the supports that were out there for small businesses. Um, you know, I think sometimes that takes that recognition that Farmers are small business people, even though they're not the main street mom and pop shops that, you know, sometimes comes to mind with that. We really pushed to get uh, the inclusion of agriculture into some of the, the paycheck protection program and 
um, economic injury disaster loans and some programs like that. Um, you know, but it's it's also been uh, working with the Farm Bureau to um, you know to to address some of the longer running concerns that they have about the competitiveness of the Illinois market. Um, one of the items that we we worked closely on was um, bringing Farm Bureau um, into the negotiations for the state's capital bill, uh, understanding that the infrastructure that Illinois has is a key component in transporting the crops that they grow or the livestock that they have from here to markets all around the world. Uh, it's really remarkable to see the logistics that go into, you know, the cornfields that we that we drive by, where those end up in different kinds of products and services, um, you know, could be thousands of miles away. And so Illinois needs effective railroad hubs and uh, waterways and interstate highways, uh, intermodal facilities, those kinds of things. Um, I, so I think it's, you know, really been trying to work with farmers to understand some of the economic challenges they have today and to see where the state can support to um, give them more opportunities to be able to sell to, to wider markets and to be able to get the best possible price for their goods. Okay, thanks. What, what is your stance on, on gun control? Um, does Illinois need to change its gun laws? And, and if so, in what ways? Well, one of the challenges we've come up with uh, during COVID, but this is, you know, this was a this was a problem prior to, to COVID, and now has been really exacerbated by that, is Illinois has already in place um, a FOID card uh, law, firearm uh, owner's identification card, as well as a concealed carry license. Both of the processing of those um, of either of those licenses has been dramatically slowed down during COVID. And people are having, are having to wait months and months and months beyond. Uh, you know, these are people who are trying to follow the laws, <laughs> who are trying to comply with the checks that go into place, who are trying to make sure that their paperwork is updated and, and you know, the background checks can happen, all those kinds of things in the appropriate period of time. Yet they're not getting any response back from uh, the state police who have to process these licenses. And in some cases, you know, people have contacted my office genuinely concerned that they're going to be found to be violating the law when you know they've they've taken all these steps to, to try to um, comply with it and so i really think that you know we need to if we're going to put in place those kind of uh, checks and, and restrictions we need to make sure that those are functioning and they're working well um, you know we saw there was the, the the tragic shooting that happened in aurora uh, a year or two ago where the individual should have been flagged during the, the background check uh, for a, a disqualifying offense that was on his record, but wasn't caught and wasn't processed in the appropriate way to, to make sure that we could enforce those rules and regulations. So I, I think it's imperative on us that if we want the FOID card to be functional, if we want the concealed carry license to be functional, we have to make sure that we're processing them in a timely fashion so law-abiding gun owners can exercise their rights, and people who are not eligible can be held accountable, um, and we can we can take intervening action. So I, I really think that's the important thing. Now, if we try to uh, introduce additional restrictions today, it would further backlog the system, and we're going to have, you know, thousands of people waiting in this middle ground where nobody knows whether they're they're a legal gun owner or not. I think that would present an even bigger problem for us uh, than, than the situation we're facing today. Okay. What do you see as some of the key differences between you and your opponent and, and what sets you apart? Well, you know, like I said, I've, I've spent um, my time in Springfield trying to lead by example in building bipartisan relationships in fighting for our area. Um, you know, this is not just something that I, that I talk about. This is not just a, a campaign point for me. Um, I've dedicated my time in Springfield to taking on and earning leadership roles in some of the most complicated and complex areas of state policy. Uh, I've shown, uh, and bill after bill after bill shows this, that you know I've developed relationships with uh, with both Republicans and Democrats from the urban part of Illinois and the rural part of Illinois um, to try to just come together with some common sense solutions. Uh, you know, I've also been able to build relationships with local officials. I mean, when when COVID hit earlier this year and everything uh, you know got put on ice and everybody was scrambling to try to figure out what to do. You know, I was able to, to reach out to mayors, 
to county board officials, to health departments. Um, I held countless number of uh, Facebook Live town halls or Zoom town halls with chambers of commerce to share information with them about programs that were available at the state and federal level to try to you know, fight for people who are looking to get to file unemployment insurance claims at a time when so were a, a million other people in the state and it was a, a very hectic time for them. Um, I, you know, I think I've been able to, to reach out to people in the governor's office, uh, people in various state agencies and advocate for and, and fight for local issues to, for grants to be given to local communities, um, for processes to take into account some of the things that are unique about our area. And so, you know, I really have tried to uh, work to develop those relationships uh, in order to be able to, to better represent people in the district. And, you know, if, uh, again, as, as we all dealt with this very unexpected scenario of, of a global pandemic, um, I think that those kinds of things were valuable that, you know, having done that work, put in the, that time during uh, a smooth uh, period of time really paid dividends um, when things got complicated. And, you know, that's, that's something that I, I have truly believed in since my first day in office. And I continue to build upon those and to try to do everything we can to represent every citizen of the district and, you know, not just one political party or another. Okay. Um, and you've touched on this a little bit um, in these remarks, but um, before we conclude, is there anything else you want to say about why voters should vote for you? You know, I've tried to be open and accessible to people. You know, we've, we have dealt with a huge number of constituent requests at our office. Um, we've shared a lot of the frustrations that people have with trying to get things processed or get status updates on, on various items. But, you know, I, I truly um, love the community that, that we serve, uh, love the state of Illinois, want to see positive things uh, for our state to give better opportunities to people who live in our area. And that's something that I've tried to fight for since the first day that I've been in office and something that I'll continue to fight for over the next two years if uh, voters grant me that opportunity. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining.